We had just celebrated Derek's 40th birthday. All of us knew that Derek didn't look like himself, that he wasn't feeling great. So we were anxious for Derek to go to the doctor. And our hope was that it was just something minor going on. So when the test started to roll in, uh, there was a, just a sinking feeling that something wasn't right. Once we got the results of the CT scan and we heard that Derek had cancer, those were long, hard days and oh, just a long, hard week of lots of fear. But also, we weren't alone. God's hand was just so intricately involved with how we were provided for. Yeah, I just couldn't imagine ever doing, going through what we went through or are going through without the body of Christ. Just thinking about our community group sitting out in the cold for us so we can come instead of being inside where it's warm and making sacrifices for us. Christian community has kept us and helped us persevere and it has been a lifeblood for us that we could not imagine going through this without. We go back um, soon to uh, do a scan and to have a follow-up with the doctor. We can see it on the, on the screen, you know, whether the, the cancer is still gone or, or, or whether it is, um, it is returned, you know, and, and so I think we have anxiety about that moment, but we are trusting God in that and that He is good and that He has the, the path laid out before us. I look forward to the day in, in heaven to kind of seeing how that all works out because when we look in the rear view of uh, what we've been through in the last five years even, we see God arranging things for our good. And I know that, that God's will will be accomplished and I'm going to petition on my behalf for healing, um, but I know ultimately uh, I get Jesus. We make our prayers and make our requests known. We know God is ultimately uh, going to answer that the best way possible. I have had questions or I have had times of wanting God to answer, like, is this going to be okay in the end? And we don't know. In the end, I have Jesus. My hope is there. It's not in what a doctor can do. It's not in a treatment. It's only in Jesus. Christ came once and, and he will come again, you know, and, and during that time um, that we have, uh, we want to be able to uh, tell others about that and, and, and um, help others experience that. Uh, and maybe our trial is one way, um, you know, that, that we're going through is one way that, that we can help um, usher others into the kingdom. Well, suffering, suffering is no respecter of persons. If it was, it would have left the Stillers alone. Um, we've known the Stillers for a long time. We've been walking with them for the last 18 months through cancer and through recovery and with lots of prayer. And, and, and I just want to tell you a couple things that you heard in that story and bring them out because because here's the truth. And, and you know, I, I'm not here to scare anybody. I'm not here to be a doomed person. But you know, all of us are going to suffer. And, and the good rule is, and you, you know this, but the more people that you're connected to, and the more people that you love, and the more people that you invite into your life, the more you're going to suffer. The more kids you have, the more you suffer. The more people you love, the more you suffer. The more friends you have, the more you suffer. And what you heard in that story, which is a true story, is you heard about two things. I just want to talk about them for a moment on Christmas Eve. The first is you heard about community. You saw them sitting out in the cold together. That was so, you know, where he said, man, it's a simple thing, isn't it? He said, hey, them sitting out for me, that meant a lot. That let me come. What you don't know is all the prayers that were prayed and all the money that was given and all the meals that were made. And the way that there, there was many of us, but particularly there was his, his and uh, Jamie, their community group came alongside them. So that's the first thing is they had community. You know what community does. Community makes the good times twice as good and the bad times half as bad. But the second thing, and in some ways just as important, maybe even more important, and I want to just talk about it for a second because hopefully you heard it, was, uh, was conviction. Did you hear all the different things they said in there? They were wrestling with it. And I love the transparency and I love the authenticity and I love the honesty and they're saying, God, I don't know, right? I don't know if you're going to... Well, we know that God heals every Christian eventually, but sometimes it's in heaven and it's not here. And they're wrestling with that. And I want to tell you two convictions that every Christian has. 
And they're really, really helpful. The first is that um, we grieve, but we do not grieve as if there is no hope, right? There's only two types of people. There's those who suffer without hope and those who suffer with hope. So we grieve, right? You cry, you hurt, but you don't, you don't hurt as those who have no hope. The second thing that I hope you heard there is, is, is kind of this thing that the Apostle Paul says, and if you're new, the Apostle Paul, he's kind of this giant who wrote half the New Testament, and he suffered more than almost anybody. He has this really interesting statement where he says, uh, he goes, I was perplexed, but I was not driven to despair. Do you know what that means? I'm confused. I don't know. I don't know why people at 40 with three kids get cancer. Right? I don't know. Well, Christianity actually doesn't answer a lot of our, the deepest kind of minute personal questions about suffering. What it does is it, sa- it says something even more profound. It says, hey, we have a God who suffered for us and who suffers with us. I'm not here to be offensive about Buddhism, but do you know what the, the, is at the center of Buddhism? A fat guy with his shirt off smiling. Right? That's the image of Buddhism. It's like, I can't relate. Okay, maybe a little bit I can relate, okay? <laughs> I could lose a little bit, but I can't in general relate. What's at the center of Christianity? A guy crucified for sinners. A guy stripped naked, dying in innocent death, asking God why. And so what's interesting is when we made that video three weeks ago, we didn't know what news they were going to get. I didn't know what I was gonna have to tell you tonight, what I was gonna have to say tomorrow. But I rejoice to say a week ago, they got a clean skin. Isn't that amazing? And so we, we are rejoicing, we are praising the Lord. And I just want to take a moment and pray because I, I don't know where you're all coming from. Uh, those of you watching online, I don't know where you're coming from. Christmas is an amplifier and a magnifier. And so the good times are better and the bad times are worse. For some people, it's like, man, first Christmas engaged, first Christmas married, you know, first Christmas with a baby, first Christmas with a home, first Christmas with a job. Uh, for other people, it's a great reminder of what they still don't have. And so I still am not married. Or it's the first Christmas without Dad's gone. Grandpa's gone. It's been a hard year. Let's pray and then let's go to God's word. Pray with me. Lord, we come to you right now in Jesus' name. I want to just thank you for the Stiller family. I thank you for their faith. I thank you for their vulnerability. It's not easy to get in front of a camera and tell a story, tell a sad story. Lord, I don't know all the stories that are represented in this room. Lord, there's a lot of loss in this room in in the year of COVID. There's a lot of joy in this room. This is what it means to be the church. We rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep, Lord. But we just praise you, Lord. Our trust is not ultimately in medicine or chemotherapy or medical doctors, but we thank you for them. We thank you that we live in a city with great hospitals. We thank you that we live with so much common grace on the other side of antibiotics. Lord, I just pray you'd prepare our hearts right now. We've got a lot going on as we end a year. calm us right now, Lord. We've got a lot going on as we've got shopping maybe to still do. As we look toward 2021 and feel all over the place about that year as well and what it's going to be like. Give us much grace. Give us time to look at your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, whether you're watching online in the VHQ venue, in the lobby, in here, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Merry Christmas to your family. Uh, What we're doing here, if you're new, if you're watching for the first time, is we're walking through the Christmas story. Now here's what's interesting. Though almost every, I think the last study said 92% of Americans love Christmas, okay? (laughs) They love it. You might love, who knows what they love about it. Do they love the cocoa? Do they love the presents? Do they love, you know, the parties? Do they love the Hallmark movies? Who knows why and what they love? But 92% of Americans said, I love Christmas. But here's what's interesting. Most Americans have no understanding of the biblical root of Christmas. And that's really our fault if you're a Christian. Kind of one of the humbling things is that we live, this is something to sit in just for a moment, okay? There's gonna be some happy times tonight too. We're sitting in some serious things. Um, (laughs) Is that we live in the greatest decline of Christianity in the history of our nation. You, 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 me. We live in the greatest decline of Christianity in the history of our nation. People have podcasts and more discretionary income and more discretionary time and more books on their Kindle, okay? And more audiobooks that they're listening to and they have no idea of the story of Christmas. Where do most people learn about Christmas from? Two areas, Christmas carols, okay? And the nativity scene. Now Christmas carols, we love them, we just sang them, okay? But some of them are wrong, okay? Have you ever heard the song, Mary Did You Know? 
Do you know the answer to that song? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's the answer. Read Luke chapter two, okay? An angel appears, tells her, Mary, did you know? Yes, very short song. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, the other, the other one is O oh, Silent Night. You love it, I love it, we love to sing it. O oh, Silent Night, okay? A baby was born in a barn. Okay, nothing silent. How many moms were like, that wasn't silent, okay? <laughs> All the dads that were in the room when the baby was born, that was not silent, okay? Not a silent night. Um, or, or we learn it from the nativity scene. The nativity, nativity scene's great. You've seen them outside. You've seen them in churches. But the, the truth is, and we'll see this tonight, the wise men, they don't get there when Jesus was born. It says they saw the star when he was born. It took them, depending on weather, three to six months. So if you want to be biblical tonight, you take the wise men, you move them into the living room. You move them in a different room, okay? And you said they'll be there in three to six months. Um, and so, so guys, what I want us to do is I want us to go back and I want us to open up your Bibles, type two, turn to uh, Matthew chapter two. With a little bit of time that we've got left, on Christmas, I want us to look at the final three responses to Jesus Christ. Every person has to respond. You have to respond. I have to respond. There's not, there's not really a third option. We either are responding positively or negatively to Jesus. And let, let's look at this story. This is in Matthew chapter two. We're just gonna start right in verse one, with, if you look at me. It says this. Now, after Jesus was born, and, and just to remind you how that happened, a, some of you have been here the whole time, but just to remind us all, a 15 or 16-year-old poor girl from a rural religious town finds out that she's going to be the only virgin pregnant in history and has to tell her future husband this. And it doesn't go well at first until an angel appears to him. And then together they have to realize that we are going to be misunderstood in our small religious town for the rest of our lives. Well, they have Jesus. And here's what it says happens immediately after Jesus was born. It says this, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from... Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So when you read the Bible, you'll notice all these interesting things like Judea and Bethlehem and King Herod and wise men and they came from the east. And you're like, well, why so much detail? Well, it's because we're reading a historical book and I want you to know this. At Christmas, uniquely, we have watching online and in, in here, we have people who maybe otherwise, and that's great, we're so glad you're with us, who aren't with us the rest of the year. And, and those people may have some questions. You may have come with a friend, you may have come with a family member tonight, you may go, what's, what's, what is Christianity all about? Well, this, let me tell you this, it's based on historical fact. It's not based on your feelings. It's not based on fairy tales. It's not based on fables. It's based on facts. It's based on the historical events of Jesus Christ and what they mean for you. It's not based on speculation or spirituality or superstition. Uh, it's not based on even on what other people believed. It's based on the historical events of Jesus. His birth, that's what we're celebrating. His life, his death, his resurrection, that's what we celebrate at Easter. So it's in the context of all of this that we begin to read the first response. Here he is. His name's King Herod, right? Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, and if you write in your Bible, you might want to write next to Herod the king, bad guy, okay? Right? Doesn't every Christmas have a bad guy? Every Christmas movie, right? Think Grinch, right? The Grinch's heart's a little too small, right? If it's, if it's not the Grinch, maybe it's Harry and Marv, okay? From Home Alone 1, Home Alone 2, okay? They're, they're, they don't like Kevin McAllister, it's like, maybe it's Scrooge, right? Every time, it, there's something right about Christmas. We get kind of this idea that at Christmas, there's always somebody who doesn't like it. Here, here he is, his name's King Herod. Behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Look at verse three. When Herod the king... And by the way, he called himself Herod the Great. He nicknamed himself that. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, literally angry. And all of Jerusalem with him and assembling all the chief priests and all of the scribes and, and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where Christ was to be born. So we're gonna see the first response to Jesus. And, and, and when I say these responses, it's not that you have one and you don't have the other. You probably have a mingling. We probably all have a mingling and mixture of all three, but here's the first one, anger. You're go, isn't that interesting? The first response that we get after Jesus is born by the first guy is anger. Now, anger is an interesting emotion. Like some of you are more angry than others. Some of you are more aware of your anger than others, right? Anger is always a secondary emotion, right? It tells you something's wrong. It tells you something's threatened. And sometimes, right, have you ever, have you ever met angry you, <laughs> right? What's angry you look like? Usually very focused on the present, very emotional, 
can't remember anything in the past, except if it's bad things the person you're mad at did, <laughs> then you have a very good memory of the past. Right? We tend to, and anger, just so you know, is not good for you. Now, we can talk about this, and we'll actually talk about this in the weeks to come. We're going to talk a little more about anger. And anger can be used rightly. Jesus got angry. God gets angry at times. But the, the unhealthy, constant anger is anger is the only emotion that we know is not good for your cardiovascular system. It basically tells your body, run away from it and run toward it at the same time. It's like putting your, your foot, one foot on the gas pedal and one foot on the brake all the time. Most of you don't even realize how angry, most people do not realize how angry they are until they get married <laughs> or until they have kids. I'm serious. It's interesting. You know, one of the reasons, do you know one of the reasons why it's so important that we keep society stable? Like why we have to in COVID, why trucks have to keep delivering food? Like, like I'm serious. Like the, the, one of the main reasons that we want society to remain safe and stable and we want the, this room to stay a good temperature so we're all okay we don't want anything too crazy to happen. I'll tell you, we actually know why. Because I don't want to meet angry you. And that's it. That's the reason. You don't want to meet angry me. We certainly don't all need to meet angry each other at the same time. And that happens in society. That's why even the worst kings often will not starve their people. Because you don't want to meet angry person. I've talked to men in the military who met angry themselves. Most PTSD, I've told you this before, is I saw myself become angry and do something I didn't know I could do. So part of it is when you read about Herod, don't be like, he's an angry guy. It's like, well, you're probably an angry guy or an angry girl. Now, let me tell you a little about Herod because you have to understand him. Now, Herod, he was all building his own empire. He called himself Herod the Great. He called himself King of the Jews. So how do you think he felt when he heard King of the Jews is born? Not, ha not happy, right? So he, he, first of all, he, and he, he called himself Herod the Great. He built himself massive cathedrals, right? And he put his name on it. And some of you go, so part of, part of what leads you to being angry, by the way, is if you're the center of the world and that's disrupted. Some of you go, I'm not doing that. Well, what about your social media account? I don't know. What about your fantasy life? What about all the conversations that you have with yourself? I mean, who knows? You probably are trying to be the center of the world. So he would build these massive empires and all that. And then he would actually, this is, he was kind of clever. Uh, he, he would dress up, this is all historically written down. He would dress up like a poor man and he would go into the common streets and he would ask people, what do you think about Herod? And you wanted to say something good, okay? <laughs> because if you didn't say something good, he killed you. So he was very that, and then he was very paranoid. He was very threatened, right? Because this is another thing that anger does. I, I get very, very threatened. Now, so what he would do when he got threatened is he would kill somebody. So his wife threatened him, he killed her. He killed three of his own sons. He killed his mother-in-law. And again, we read that and we go, well, we would never, and, and we probably would never kill somebody. But what, what do we have? Cancel culture. What, what do women do to each other? Women are amazing at destroying each other's reputation. The literature on that is clear. That's what high school girls and college girls do to each other. They don't like each other. It's complete gossip and destroy your reputation. It's a kind of death. I'll kill you. I'll kill all of your social opportunities. And so part of what happens when we read these stories of like Herod, we're like, isn't Herod such a jerk? It's like, yes, and we're kind of like him. And part of what makes the Bible come alive and part makes history come alive is for you not to read the Bible like you're the worst, or sorry, like you're the best person in it. <laughs> you know, read, read the Bible like you're the perpetrator, okay? Like you're the worst person in it. And it'll, even if you're not, it'll be good for you to read the Bible that way. And so what we see here is he gets very, very angry and watch how he responds. Look at what he says. This is in verse seven. He says this. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have come and found him, bring, word, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Because if you look back at the verses before that, it said that he was born king of the Jews. Now that's interesting. See what's offensive it's interesting, what is, what is Herod, if I could bring it down, what do people most, what angers people most about Jesus Christ? That he claims to be king. That's it. We don't mind, someone once said, we don't mind little baby Jesus, we mind Lord Jesus. And again, if you're new, if you're watching online, if you're here for the first time, if Christianity is new to you, welcome. I wanna tell you something. The shortest confession of the Christian faith is Jesus is Lord. That's it. I mean, it's it. You know, it's like, well, we, you know, we, we want to be helpful. How, what's the most simple, straightforward, you can't reduce it anymore. It's three words. It's four syllables. <laughs> well, what is it? It's Jesus is Lord. 
What do you have to do to become a Christian? You have to say that from the deepest part of you. That's it. You have to understand what God has done. You have to say Jesus is Lord, which is, a rent, which is basically saying, I'm not Lord. Right? And what happens is a lot of us, we want to be in control of our lives. What COVID has showed us is we're not very good at it. We were not good at it beforehand. We're definitely not good at it now. Right? And there's two types of people. There's those people who are there trying to be the Lord of their life and you're not doing a good job, right? You're a bad, bo- you're a bad boss and a worse employee. Okay? You're not doing very good with yourself. There's others of you, you struggle a little bit more with insecurity. You're, you're a little more insecure. You, maybe you struggle with uh, peer pressure. Maybe you struggle with codependency. You know, maybe you struggle with people pleasing. What you're doing in that is you're making somebody else king of your life. Now, now you know, it's like in that, that somebody else becomes the most important person in your life. And that's a dangerous thing. Like, I love my wife. She's a great wife. We've been married for a decade. We've got three kids together. She's a great wife, very crummy king. <laughs> very crummy God in my life. And that's what often happens with people. So I want you to see what he does. He goes and he sends these people. Hey, look what he says, verse eight. I want you to see this one more time. He says this, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I, may, that I too may come and worship him. Now, does, you should know this even if you don't know the story, just from the context. Does Herod want to worship Jesus? The answer is no, right? He's using his words to manipulate people. Do we ever do that? The answer is yes, we do that all the time. <laughs> How do we know we do that? Our kids do that when they're very young, right? You know that my kids will do this all the time. They'll have a conversation. I can hear them in the other room. Who's gonna come talk to dad? <laughs> right? This is how, I mean, all, all, if you ever look at a kid, what is a kid? A more simple version of you. That's what a kid is. A more simple, more emotional, more one-sided version of you. So what do they do? They, right, and me. They, 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 they kind of talk, who's gonna go, you know, and, and then they send them you know, send them to me or depending on the off topic or send it to Margie. And then what do they do? They say very nice things. I normally believe them. I try to, you know, and then they, then they ask for something. It's manipulating. Now, now here's the principle though. Um, a lot of people, their response to Jesus is fine. I'll have Jesus if it will get me something else. Do you understand that? So he, he really wants to just remain king. So in his, he wants Jesus so he can kill him. We want Jesus. Why do people want Jesus? People want Jesus for all different reasons. I mean, less and less today, but historically, why do people want Jesus? They want a good marriage. Right? If you want to stay married, you better stay in the church. So then Jesus becomes the way that, you know, I get married, you know. Maybe people want their finances, you know, maybe people want their finances to go straight. So they pray and they ask Dave Ramsey into their heart, okay? <laughs> they start coming, they, they start learning the biblical, because there's a lot of good biblical principles. They learn good biblical principles about finances and resources and money. And they're like, this is great. This is it. I, I love Jesus because Jesus got me a, a balanced budget. Sometimes people, you know, I really want Jesus because I want my kids to end up not being too, 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 too crazy. So we got to get our kids in the church. And you'll know, you don't really know, it's, it's interesting, you know, we don't know ourselves very well. Like if, you know, we wouldn't need anthropology and psychology and counseling and uh, philosophy if, if you knew yourself well. You don't, I don't. So what, well, oftentimes you don't even know what you want Jesus for until you don't have it, right? So then you start saying things like, God, why didn't you? It's like, oh, that was the deal. That was the deal. You wanted me so that you would be healthy. That, and it wasn't revealed, right? You don't know what you don't have till you don't have it. And so he tries to manipulate the situation. He says, I want Jesus for another purpose. And then he says this. He gets even more angry. Look at, drop down to verse 16. We're gonna come back. We gotta drop down to see the end of the story with Herod. We're gonna move on from him in a moment. Here's what happens at the end. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became furious, really, 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 really angry, right? If you don't deal with your anger, does it get better or does it get worse? It gets worse, right? What ends up happening? You end up blowing up at your spouse or your friend. You're like, why did I do that? Because you weren't responding to the last, to that one time. You were responding to the last 25 times. You didn't say anything and you didn't do anything. So he becomes incredibly furious. He sent, and this is very sad and very, very similar to the birth of Moses. The birth of Jesus and the birth of Moses, very similar. He became furious and he sent and he killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. So the final reason that, and it's connected to Jesus' lordship, why does he get mad at Jesus? Because Jesus won't do what he wants him to do. He, he won't control, he can't control Jesus. Have you ever noticed that? You're like, Jesus, follow me. He's like, you got the command backwards, <laughs> right? Jesus, will you just please answer all of my prayers and do everything that I want you to do? And would you do it right on my timeline that I want you to do it on? And Jesus says, I won't. Well, you, this is why the Lordship of Christ is so important. Lord, I'm gonna submit to you. 
I can't, you know, no Lord is an oxymoron. I can't say no Lord in the same sentence. It doesn't make sense. So we begin to see that what happens with Herod is he gets very angry primarily because of the Lordship of Christ. Now here's the good news. Jesus, this is the good news. Jesus is a good king. We'll move on to the next, next thing, but I want you to know that, that Jesus is a good king. He doesn't want to hurt you. He wants to help you. He wants to heal you. He wants to bring you hope. The, the great uh, lie that we believe is, man, if I gave my life to Christ, it would become terrible. It's like, no, actually, Jesus would give you what you need, and he would give you what's best for you, not necessarily what you'd want. So that's the first response. The first response I wanted us to look at today is the response of being a good king, but they are angry. But Herod is angry. Second response I want you to see is a little different. We've got to go back through the passage and see it. So first there was Herod. Now we're going to focus on religious people. So, and, and this is a good thing to think about. When you think about all the people in the world, you can divide them up a lot of different ways. A very good way to divide them up is rebellious and religious. Right? So you can think rebellious, they hang out on Trade Street. Okay? <laughs> religious, they hang out in the church. Okay? Rebellious, they, they run away from God a certain way. Religious, they hide from God in the church. And here's what it says. I want, you to, I want to read this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, we're back in verse one. In the days of Herod the king, so he's the bad guy who's angry. Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. We're not gonna focus on them yet. We'll focus on them next. Saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him and assembling, and here it is, he calls in the religious people. He calls in the Awana kids. He calls in the Sunday school people, okay? He calls in the people who were in youth group all their life and did college ministry and all that kind of stuff. He says this, assembling all of the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Look at verse five. They knew, they knew, they told him. In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet, and, and they quote it, and, and we guess they quoted it by memory. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So what's interesting is he goes to the religious people, and I want to spend some time on this because this would be my biggest concern as a pastor in a, in a, in a city like Winston-Salem that has 516 church buildings, is that we would have the second response, which is Apathy. The first response is I'm angry at God's lordship. The second response is I'm apathetic to God's word. Do you notice that they know, they actually can quote by heart a verse of the Bible that you probably, and I wouldn't have known had I not known the reference, don't even know where that book's from, but that verse is from. It's from Micah chapter five, verse two. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if you've ever read that book. My guess is many of you may have never even read that book. They could quote the exact verse from it. But here's the thing, they don't go, can I come with you? So when we get to the, you don't see the scribes, right? You don't see the scribes and the chief priests. They're never in the nativity scene because they don't care to go. And this is the great danger in Christianity is that we have head knowledge, but no heart desire. I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy named Paul David Tripp. I recommend any book he's written. He's a counselor. And I heard him share his story one time. He's in his 60s now, maybe. And he was talking about a season of his life. He said, you know, I woke up and he said it was several mornings in a row he said, and I read the Bible, he said, just like I normally did. He said, and I finally, he said, I just, I wasn't feeling much. He said, I went over to my wife. He said, and I took my Bible in front of her and I said, would you pray for me? I, I'm reading this and feeling nothing. And he said, how many of us are, would be honest, we sometimes feel like that. I'm reading this and I, it's do, having no effect on my life. Right, because there, there's the head, you know this, there's the head, the heart, and the hands, right? There's the mind, the will, and the emotions. And all of us are supposed to come to Christ. Now, what happens in America, let me tell you how it works out. People trade in attendance. I'm talking about people who actually come to church. I'm not talking about anyone who doesn't come to church. I'm, that, I'm talking about the religious people. They, they settle for attendance instead of transformation, and, and I don't know how it exactly works. See, I, I, again, I, I, I can struggle with this too, but as somebody who grew up not in the church, it's hard for me to understand. I get it more now that I've got kids and I've been around the things of God for a long time because that's what happens when you get around the things of God a lot. You get familiar with them. 
You learn the Christianese. You learn how to tell people. You learn how to make listening noises. Mm-hmm. Right? You, you, right? You learn how to tell people you're praying for them even though you're not. I mean, you, you learn kind of all of the things. All, you, know, you know how to say you're listening. You know, you're being led by God even though you don't care. I mean, you, and it's kind of really, really scary because sometimes you can do those things. You don't even realize that you're doing them. And it's a constant fear, right? It's a constant fear. Every parent who has kids who, tries, who genuinely cares about their salvation and raises them in the home cares that they, they want their kid to actually be transformed. Not just a 10 kids ministry and then a 10 youth group and then go to a Christian school or I don't know, or something like that. Like, you know, we're, we're, we take our kids through the Christmas story each year and we got them a chocolate calendar this year and we read the Advent story and give them a chocolate calendar. Are they more excited about the Advent story or the chocolate calendar? The chocolate calendar, right? I mean, it's a little, little, little piece of chocolate too. Uh, you know, you'll be telling the story that, yeah, Jesus was born as a virgin to save the entire world. Dad, is it time to eat the chocolate? It's like, oh. You know, but that's, that's what, I mean, you think about it. It's like, why does missions exist? Why does missions exist? Because lots of people don't know that story. Do you know that we have a family in our church that they're, they're here on furlough right now? They moved their entire lives to Laos. It's so far away that, they're so, it's so far away that when we were talking about visiting them for the first time, they said, a plane only comes to us twice a week. So I'm, I, I, all I'm saying is, why do people go to Laos? Because people, that story is not well known. So people trade in a, attendance for transformation. That one of the most awkward conversations I have with people are people who come to our weekender and want to get baptized and aren't Christians. You know, and it's like, well, you talk to them and you, they, and you say, when did you become a Christian? I've always been a Christian. It's like, wrong answer. Try again. No one's always been a Christian. You know. What, what is Christianity about? Well, following Jesus' example. Wrong answer. Part, maybe partially an answer, but tell me about the cross. Tell me about forgiveness. And it's just amazing how often people don't understand these things. And, and just so you know, our commitment at Two Cities Church is to try to talk about them. So you're like, Kyle talks about the same things all the time. Good, you're getting it, okay? Um, we try to talk about things in such a simple, clear way that we would make it very hard to go from Two Cities Church to hell. We want to just be super clear about who Jesus is, what his message is, how you have a relationship with him, how you repent and believe. So, so the first thing is they attend. The second thing is it never att att attaches their emotional life. Now listen, this is important to know whether you're a Christian or not. There are two levels. This is Jonathan Edwards came up with this. I'm not this smart. Jonathan Edwards is the uh, greatest mind America's ever produced. That's what people say, whether they're Christians or not. He just, he studied 13 hours a day, right? This is before TV. He studied 13 hours a day, Okay. <laughs> He would ride around on his horse and, and pin notes to his jacket as he would ride around. You know, that was his way to kind of drive and text. Um, and, and he just had all of these kind of ideas. And, um, and one of the things he, he realized after meditating on things for a long time is that there's something underneath your emotions, which are your affections. So, you know, you might say, like, I'm embarrassed. Well, that's kind of an emotion, right? I'm embarrassed, whatever. The question would be, what, would be the, what are your affections? Your affections are what you love and hate. The hard thing is you can't change what you love and hate. What happens in the new birth, what happens when a person becomes a Christian is they get a new heart and they love new things and they hate new things. And I can speak of this from experience. I, mean, I grew up in a church-going home in a nominal Catholic family with great parents. And I knew all of the stories. I had all the knowledge. I knew the Adam and Eve story. I knew the cross story. I knew the resurrection story. I knew that people are sinful. I knew that Jesus was Lord. I knew the Bible was the word of God. And I had a friend who just shared all of this with me. In about a two-week period, my entire life changed. Believe me, none of my Roman Catholic friends from high school can believe that I'm a pastor now. But I, my whole life completely changed. And all of a sudden, I mean, I was like, I love the Bible. That's strange. I want to pray. That's weird. I, I, I want to be around God's people. I need new good, good, I need like new best friends. I'm starting to feel like really bad about some of the sinful things I've done in my past and I'm wanting to not do things anymore and it was just like, just like this whole, everything began to change. It really was what happened is my affections changed. What happened with the scribes is they have, the Bible talks about a lot of different ways. They had a knowledge of God with no power. They had a form of godliness with no spirit. So they're apathetic. I want us to see the third response. So the first response is anger. The second response is apathy. The third response is from the wise men. Look at verse seven. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently 
This is the wise men. Diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. I want to talk about these wise men for a little bit. We don't know a ton about them. What we know is there wasn't three of them, okay? I think that the, the tradition said there was three because there was three gifts. We'll see that in a little bit. Um, but most likely it, there was, you know, at least a dozen of them, more likely. These would have been the scientists of the day. They would have been the people who knew how to study. They were watching the stars, right? If you don't know, the science is only 500 years old, like in its current form. And so science is fairly new in human history. So these would have been the quote unquote scientists today. And it's interesting because a lot of times people think, you know, we talked in the series, is Christianity for young people? Yeah, Mary and Joseph. Is Christianity for kind of the down and out, the blue collar person? Yep, the shepherds. Is Christianity for old people? Yep, Simeon and Anna. Um, is Christianity for religious people who can change? Yep, scribes. You know, is Christianity for smart people? Yes. It's interesting, you know, have you ever heard of Francis Collins? Francis Collins, you could look him up sometime. Francis Collins, let me say this. I mean, some of you are smart, probably, my guess is, none of you are smarter than Francis Collins, okay? <laughs> Francis Collins was the head of the Human Genome Project, okay? <laughs> smart guy. If you know Francis Collins, he was the chief resident um, at UNC Chapel Hill, not that, that far down the street. In his third year of medical school, a couple things collided in his life. His obsession and fascination with medicine and watching a lot of people die. And you have to have him tell, but he tells the story that in his third year of medicine, a very smart guy who's gonna go on and run the Human Genome Project, okay? But um, he sees this, I think she was an older woman die. Maybe she was middle-aged. And she dies in peace. And he's like, I I've seen a lot of people die, not a lot of people die in peace. And it was his fascination with science and his conversations with this woman that led him to Christ in the middle of medical school. And what's interesting is what you'll see here is what happens with the wise men are two things. They see stars, but they need scripture. So they see stars, they, they don't understand what it means, and then they have to go to somebody who goes, here's what that means. And what you'll see in your life is that God will often use stars and scripture. My star was called Joe Ducko. You've never heard of him. He's a pastor in Vancouver right now. He became a Christian at 17 years old and said, man, you want to go grab coffee? And through him, he led me to my first Bible. He led me to the first understanding of the gospel. Sometimes stars are a church. Sometimes it's a parent. Sometimes it's a friend. A lot of times it's a bad thing that happens to you. And you realize, okay, God whispered in my pleasure, spoke to me every day, but he's using a megaphone in my pain. So these wise men, they begin to, you can see it. It says they, they, sought, they sought after the Lord diligently. I want to pick up and I want you to, to, to see their threefold response, which shows up in verse nine. It says this, after listening to the king, that would be Herod, the anger response, they went on their way, which is a stark contrast to how the scribes um, and, the high, and, and the priest had responded. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, and we're gonna see the three things and we'll take them apart, but here's the first thing. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Three things about their response. First, they responded joyfully. Man, what a difference our lives would be. What a difference we can make. If you, in this room, if you're a Christian, what, what a difference we can make if we would just decide to be a joyful people. In, in the year of 2019, or 20, end of 2019 and into all of 2020, in, yeah, and maybe into 2021, because right, part of it's like, we don't even know what this next year holds. What would it look like for us to just be an incredibly joyful people? I don't know if you ever heard of Bill Bright. Bill Bright's one of my heroes. I never got to meet him. Bill Bright found out he was going to die by suffocation. And he said, amazing, I get to die the way Jesus died. That's the kind of guy he was. Bill Bright started Campus Crusade for Christ, which you probably know now know his crew. When Bill Bright died, I read his final book that he wrote. And I, on the back cover, there was all these endorsements about, about him from senators, from people all over the world, from heads of nonprofits, from pastors. I'll never forget. I read one. It said, to know Bill Bright 
was to know God better. Someone else wrote, a senator wrote, um, in a crazy world, Bill Bright let me know God still reigned. And I, I was like 18 when I read that. Thought, but th- wouldn't that be cool to be that type of person? To have such a joy. I mean, there's four words used. Do you see it? I mean, the words are, it's again and again. When they saw the star, they rejoiced. Okay, that would be enough. No, exceedingly. No, okay, that would be enough. With great joy. It's just constantly joy. Can I tell you what your kids need from you? A fully submitted to the Lord, joyful version of yourself. That's it. That's actually what, what, are your, what does your spouse need? What do your parents need? What do your kids need? What do your friends need? What does your boss need? What does your neighbor need? What does your employee need? A fully submitted, fully joyful version of yourself. The first thing is they're joyful. The second thing is they're humble. Do you see that? It says this, verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped him. So we see just a, a great humility, right? It's, it's, you could show humility a lot of different ways, but one of the ways you show it is physically. Christianity is the only religion that is designed to humble you. It's there to humble you. Nobody can be prideful standing next to the cross of Jesus Christ. When you realize, when you go, okay, God created me, so that humbles me because I'm a creature and I'm finite and I'm ignorant and I'm going to die. <laughs> That would be enough to humble you if you'd think about it for a long time and humble me if I'd think about it for a long time. As soon as you think about all you don't know, that should humble you immediately. And then the second thing that should humble us is that God so loved us that he sent his son. That's humbling. He loved me that much, that humbles me. And then third, it should humble us that we were so terrible that Jesus Christ had to die. And so when you realize these things, it just creates this humble worship where I didn't save myself. I can't save myself. I won't save myself. And when I get to heaven and God says, why should I let you in? I would say, not because of anything that I've done, but only completely what somebody else did for me. That's a humbling statement to make. But then third and finally, so joyful, what would it look like for you this year for you to be joyful, for you to be humble? But then it's right here in the text. Finally, for you to be generous. I want you to see this, verse 11. In going into the house, they saw the child. So no longer a baby, and now a child. It took them a while to get there. With Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts. Three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What has happened, and this is one of the ways, I mean, there's a couple ways, and I've given you guys them over the, over the years as we've been here. There's a couple ways you can know you're a Christian. One of the ways is that your affections have deeply changed. We talk about that. Um, you love different things. You hate different things. One of the other ways that you know that you're really a Christian is that your Christian faith has touched your schedule and your budget. Like what's interesting is each of us, depending on how it works, each of us every year gets a tax return. And we can look at the tax return and we can see how much have we given to the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about Two Cities Church. I'm I'm saying just in general, how much have we given to the kingdom of God? And I mean, I I don't know how else to say it. If the number is zero, I don't think you're, I I don't know how you're a Christian if you have any kind of income. If the number is so insignificant of a percentage of your overall income, I don't know if you're a Christian. Because as soon as you realize that God has been generous toward us, It overflows in your heart to want to be generous back to other people. So what we see with Jesus is three gifts are offered, right? Gold, why gold? He's a king. Why frankincense? It's what the priest had. He's gonna be a priest. He's going to heal us. He's going to help us. He's going to heal our souls. Why myrrh? It was to foreshadow his death. It's what you bury people in. Jesus Christ, we say this each week as we talk about this, that Jesus Christ was born to die. That even though um, Christianity and Christmas start all about the cradle and the crib, the shadow that hangs over the cradle and the crib is the shadow of the cross. And what we see is today we saw three different responses. Here's the good news about Christianity. Here's the good news real practically about tonight. 
Wherever you are, you can change your response to Christ today. That's, the, that, that's what it means to be human. That's what it means to be made in God's image. So are you angry? <laughs> Some of you are like, I'm just angry. Well, here's a good idea. Be more angry at yourself and your sin and use that anger to repent and trust in God and turn away, instead of, and turn away from your sin. Instead of resisting God, use that to run toward God. For some of you, you, you're just apathetic, right? I mean, that's kind of the American spirit. Play video games, live in my parents' basement. Will somebody else please pay for everything? There's the apathetic nature of our culture. There's the apathetic nature of spirituality. I read a study recently that said most high schoolers who grew up in the church don't fall away from the faith. They just simply stop pursuing it. It's almost different. What motivates us to continue to follow Jesus Christ is to realize his pursuit of us. So whether you have apathy or whether you have anger, we should be more like the wise men and respond in adoration. Finally, as we head off for, for the year, as we head into a, kind of a week and then we head into 2021, what a great question, what a great thought to think, who could you maybe be a star for? Who could you, maybe over this holiday season, you're gonna see friends or you're gonna see family or you're gonna see neighbors or you're gonna see somebody. Who could you use your influence in this unique season to point them to Christ and to point them to the scriptures? Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you so much for Christmas. I thank you for the ways that we get to see different people respond. Lord, we just have to admit that we're often like Herod. Lord, we're angry. Who knows why everyone in this room is angry? Some people, are, they're angry at the opposite sex. <laughs> Some people, they're angry at people who are more beautiful than them. They're angry at people that are better than them. They're angry at people who are richer than them. We get angry at all types of things, Lord. Help us. Lord, help us to confess our anger. Anger toward others, anger toward you, Lord. Some people in here are angry because you've not done what they've asked you to do. Lord, help them to realize the joy of the Lordship of Christ. Lord, others in here are just apathetic. Lord, would you motivate us with the gospel? Would you motivate us that Jesus Christ made the longest journey, longer than the wise men, to come and to seek and to save us, Lord? Lord, Lord, would we respond individually as families and as a church with those three words, with joy, with humility, and with generosity, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.